I'll leave you to it. Okay, thank you very much, Victoria. Okay. We have a feedback problem here. Give me a second. Now we are ready. Dr. Shiva, thank you very much for your time to being with us. For us, it's such a pleasure, such a honor. And let me just go a little bit in Spanish to introduce the, the interview. And after we, we will follow in English for you, okay? <laughs> Hola a todos, a todos aquí en, en Bioguía, a toda la audiencia, pues estamos felices, muy contentos de tener aquí a, a la doctora Bandana Shiva, eh, quien ha trabajado, estudiado y publicado ensayos durante décadas para luchar contra los efectos de la agroindustria. Sus estudios van desde los daños a la salud, a la economía y sobre todo a la vida misma y a la biodiversidad. Yo los invito a que revisen su obra, tiene aproximadamente 14 libros publicados sobre la biopiratería, Justicia de la Tierra, Comercialización de los Recursos Naturales, la Biodiversidad y un Largo, etc. Y por si fuera poco, es maestra en Filosofía de la Ciencia y doctora en Física Cuántica. Como les decimos en la descripción, eh, este video después va a aparecer con subtítulos más adelante en los días subsiguientes. So, Dr. Shiva, thank you, uh, Dr. Shiva, thank you very much. Uh, I'm go straight to... to to the questions okay thank you. So, thank you thank you very much we are uh, so excited uh, with, with you here in biogia okay so uh, within your extensive and exhaustive work you cover a huge set of consequences of the agro-industrial uh, production and consumption in our lives so i don't want to ask you for the issues that you already cover deeply in your in your work But briefly, just to, to warm up, can you explain us explain to us how does this way of thinking where we use external inputs uh, like pesticides, herbicides, uh, syn and synthetic fertilizers affect our condition as uh, human beings? Well, the dependence on external inputs, which are in additional external inputs of leftover war chemicals has three major impacts on us as human beings and our condition as being part of the earth, as being living or, and part of the earth. The first is the idea of external inputs kills the earth in your mind. It kills the soil. It kills the knowledge of biodiversity. It kills with it the knowledge of the peasants in India who bred the amazing rices and Mexico who built amazing mazes, it's reduced to zero. So it becomes what the legal jurisprudence of British imperialism was, was terra nullius. It creates emptiness. In order to make the external input necessary, that there is no life in the soil if the fertilizer makes it, the pests would totally damage the um, crop There's nothing like an insect in that worldview. Everyone is an enemy. Every plant, including the wonderful plants we eat, I know all over the world, wild edibles are the most nutritious plants. But they are too an enemy, must be wiped out by glyphosate. So it creates an emptiness and converts terra madre, the living earth, into terra nullius, the dead earth. Okay. But with it, It makes our minds empty of this amazing knowledge of millennia, of the amazing oneness with the earth, the recognition that we are earth beings, we are interbeings, we breathe the trees, we eat the soil organisms, and that's what makes for our health. So this disconnection is then not only an intellectual incapacity of human beings to think fully, as being part of the earth, but it is also creating the health incapacity where we are becoming very sick because it's only through the interconnectedness of biodiversity of the soil and the plants and our gut microbiome will we be healthy. So when we said everything is dead and only the toxics as external inputs bring life, then we will kill ourselves. And why are 75% of the chronic diseases that are affecting the world, food-related diseases. And this will go much further if this worldview is allowed to unfold to its next step, 
which is totally false food made in labs. Okay, okay. So you have been talk a lot about uh, about this in 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 your in your books, but you even mentioned that the genetic manipulation could lead us to 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 diseases, and 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 you even mentioned pandemias uh, when when you talk about this this issue. Do do you think that there is a relationship between the pandemia that we are living and 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 all this? agro-industrial uh, ecocide way of producing and eating and consuming? Very, very clearly. The United Nations has itself admitted that we should be looking at pandemics as results of our war against the earth. Most of the new infectious diseases, the old infectious diseases, we've been managed to deal with them. The new infectious emerging diseases are all a result of a single phenomena, invading into the habitats and homes of other species, mm. animals, mm. monkeys, bats, and making the animals refugees in their own mm. homes. And the viruses on those animals become refugees. Okay. In the forest, the monkeys are fine. But when the forest is taken away from the monkeys because you have to grow GMO corn, uh, soya in the Amazon or palm oil in Indonesia or palm oil in the Congo, you mm. invade into the forests. Mm. And then the animals have no homes. So Ebola comes out, the HIV comes out. In India, we have very detailed study of a monkey disease that as, as the fact Packets, patches of forest, this deforestation happen in the rainforest. People in villages around these fringes started to get this new hemorrhagic fever called the monkey disease. Castle disease is called in particular. So 300 new emergent infectious diseases are a result of the industrial system that knows no limits, doesn't respect food as food, doesn't respect food as nourishment, which must go back to the soil to give us future food, must go back to the bees and the butterflies and other animals to feed them, which must nourish us and be healthy. Food is merely a commodity and the production system is merely a place for selling external inputs, the leftovers of the war, the mm -hmm. leftover chemicals that became chemical fertilizers, leftover pesticides, the leftover herbicides, Agent Orange was used in Vietnam mm. as a war chemical. And now we mm. use it in our fields. Mm. Um, and the output is a commodity. And then it doesn't matter what the commodity is for. 90% of the corn and soya in the world is used for animal feed and biofuel. So people yeah. go hungry, animals are homeless, their diseases become our new pandemics. Mm. So it is uh, clearly both the infectious diseases and the non-infectious, non-communicable chronic diseases, both the two health pandemics are related to the globalized, industrialized chemical food system based on limited stupidity, limited irresponsibility, limited warfare against the earth, and worst, looking only for money and destroying the health of the planet and people. Definitely. Thank you very much for that response. I think it's so important to, to, to be aware of that right now in the conditions that we are living, no? So, uh, and recently you talk about a, a concept that you, 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 you call it like fake foods and, and veganism. No? And, and you made a call to young people to, 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 to have a reflection on, on this. Can, can, can you explain us a, a little bit more about what do you mean with this fake foods and, and what is the relation with veganism? Because of course, in our audience, there is a lot of, of, of vegan people or people that cares about animals and, and biodiversity. So it's a little, could be a little bit like shocking, no? Like why Dr. Ashiva yeah. saying that? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so I come from the land of the sacred cow. And 
where I'm sitting is used to be my mother's cow shed. And when I wanted to, when wanted to leave institutions and my job, sure. my mother said, don't hesitate, take the cow shed and start your foundation. So the research foundation for science, technology and ecology was started in a cow shed where I had grown up with my mother's cows. We never tortured the cows, we got the leftover milk. My, for my mother, the cows were her first children. We were secondary. We did not have anthropocentrism in our culture or in my upbringing. So I've never seen a, a association of milk and yogurt with violence. Uh -huh. Western children have seen factory farming and they think every cow is kept that way. I have seen the cows in this building uh -huh. and they were loved as, so, as the cows in India by the small farmer. You know, one woman with two cows, mm. sustaining her family with no land, two cows. The biggest economy of India is dairy and mm. it's a women's economy. So I am a deep follower of Gandhi and nonviolence. And mm. for me, nonviolence is about a system. Mm. It's not a product. You, know? mm. you don't buy a thing or not buy a thing. Nonviolence and violence <laughs> has a more deep systemic root. So when, if I am feeding the animals food they don't want, they are herbivores, they should be eating grass. Mm. And if I feed them GMO soya bean, their poor stomachs are going to be very upset. Mm. Mm. Then I take cows who should be ranging, drawing, roaming free and put them into prisons which is what the concentrated animal farm operations are, the factory farms, <clears throat> then you do violence a second time. The first violence is the feed. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. second violence is the way you keep them. And because of the violence in the chain, the product from them becomes violent. Mm -hmm. Now for any thoughtful human being, two things are very clear. No one should, should touch factory farm meat. No one. Mm -hmm. And there's a way, there's a way to avoid it because there's a way to be vegetarian. There's a way to be, uh, uh, you vegan. know, uh, 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 vegan as a philosophy of holistic nonviolence. Okay. But if I make dairy criminal, even when it's one cow uh, in the home of a woman who has to bring up her children on hmm. the basis of that cow and its calves, that woman will love that calf more than her children. So that woman will never be violent. To assume violence for other people whom you don't know is a violent thought itself. Mm. So respect the fact that the cat, the, uh, uh, the lovely pastoralists in the desert of Rajasthan, the camel herders, they drink milk. Mm. They're not violent to the animals. You should see their images. Come, come to Pushkar, come next November. Come and see the love with which we live with the animals. The second thing is, if you don't think of the whole system and A, you criminalize nonviolent communities and make their livelihoods impossible, you are robbing women of their livelihoods. You are robbing children of food mm -hmm. and worse. You are basically saying, let the cow disappear mm. from farms. And therefore you're writing a death knell for animals. While you think you're protecting them, you're actually killing the cow by saying we don't need her anymore. Okay. We don't need her for fertilizing. We don't need the animals. You know, I have refused to have tractors on our farm in Navdanya. Cool. And the male offspring are, are animal energy. And when people say, oh, they're working, but we work. Our body is meant to spend energy. Anim humans are animals too. Mm. Let's recognize that if we should work, animals can work with us. And it's the answer to fossil fuels. So all I would say to the vegans is, yes, we must absolutely shun violence in the food system, including violence to our gut. Mm. Now, you can be a wonderful, committed vegan. And if you commit yourself, to this, Silicon Valley wanting to determine your, your lab food, mm -hmm. and you become part of this, you're violating your own integrity 
as a human being connected to a living earth. Our health, I have written so many books on this. Our health comes from the soil, from the plants, from the animals with which we grow, the fauna, the flora, and all of that is connected to our gut microbiome. You destroy the biodiversity outside, you're going to destroy the biodiversity inside. So if you're not a thoughtful vegan, and you're a blind follower of the next step of the industrial food system, Mr. Gates and Silicon Valley, the four technical giants want your food. And they're calling it plant-based, but they want to grow the GMO soya. Mm -hmm. But now as raw material and carbohydrates, like they used it for biofuel, now they wanted to use it for raw material for fake food. And your poor gut will be a very unhappy gut with everything made from the same GMO soya bean, with the same Roundup residue, veganism will then be inadequate to either heal the planet or yourself. You will be perpetuating the problem. So look at the art of eating in a holistic way. Look at nonviolence in the systems level, not as a narrow consumer who is blinded by propaganda for those who, while we were sick with COVID, walked away with two, three trillion more just sitting mm. around. You want to give them all of the profits of the world and hand over the Mexican cuisine and the Indian cuisine and African cuisine and say, give us big food. I don't want to be in a world where the four robber barons of our times, these are the robber barons, you know, inside Silicon Valley's mission to change what we eat. They've set their eyes. I started Navdanya <coughs> because I did not accept the Monsanto illusion that seeds are their invention, they're mm. machines, farmers must not have their native seeds, and everyone should grow GMOs. I said it's wrong at every level. It's wrong as an idea. It's wrong as science. It's wrong as violating the farmer's rights to save and have seeds. So I started the movement for seed freedom. But what happened to seed then? is happening to food now. On the fake impossible burger, which some e vegans are eating happily, there are 14 patterns. Mm. Every fake ingredient has a patent attached to it. You are making the trillionaires, richer trillionaires, while you're making yourself sick. So love your body, love your mind, love your freedom, and think about your relationships with the living earth. Okay. Thank you for that. That's such a deep uh, reflection but that drives me to 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 the subject that uh, because you mentioned it like three times like the the the, the, the systemic way of thinking you know uh, mm -hmm. which, which yeah. is something that 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 we we something that we didn't learn in in our culture no occidental culture is more like a linear one no no so how do how, how do you do, how do you think that regular people and this is a question that comes from the audience because we open it in in here yeah, we we open it the, the questions from the audience and and one of the the persistence questions of the audience was okay how how can I participate or, 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 or what can I do as a regular people being in a city where I can start to, to, to collaborate with this needed change in, you know, in a way to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's wrong to say Occidental people are linear in their thinking. I think the more correct description would be over 500 years of colonization, Occidental people's minds have been colonized. You know, there were three phenomena in colonization. The mm. colonization of other cultures. Mm. Yeah? That is a very clear process and we all recognize that. And those of us who were colonized, you know, we have our own histories. We have the colonizer's history. There's a mm. British history mm. that says the 1857 revolt was a Sepoy mutiny. The soldiers revolted. No, it was the people of India who revolted on bread. Bread was the symbol. Mm. And they said, you are stealing our bread and we will get our feed, seed freedom and food freedom back. And it was the first freedom movement of India. So we have our histories. Mm. 
the colonizers write our histories, but we don't forget. But the West has forgotten two things. And the, everyone will have to remember this. First, even before Christopher Columbus set sail, 10 years before that, the most learned people of Europe were killed in the witch hunts. The Pope Innocent I, Papal Bull, triggered by true <coughs> German priests. Mm -hmm. And in Germany, Christianity was being married at that point to the issue of money making. Mm -hmm. And the German priest wrote a book called The Witch's Hammer. And basically they said, anyone who thinks differently, anyone who is a healer, anyone who, women who are take care of childbirth, this, they should just be declared witches and be killed. So European witch hunts were really, I call it an epistemocide, along with being a femicide, nine million people, most of them women. That is how that knowledge was killed. Mm. We have to make it again because knowledge is available for all. Yeah, there's a, a distorted trajectory of mechanistic reductionist fragmented science okay. that started with the witch hunts, but there is other systems of knowledge, the new systems knowledges of quantum theory, of the new biologies, of the systems of, uh, sci of ecological sciences and all the amazing indigenous traditions, they are there for us to learn from. No human being is a static being. Yeah, a human being isn't like the span. Yeah, you're black with a little red and that's it, you're fixed. Okay. A human being is evolutionary potential unfolding every day with consciousness, every day. Hmm. And when you open your mind and say, oh, our minds were narrowed down and shut down with this mechanistic idea. And I won't let my mind be linear. I will let it flower with a diversity of the mind. Mm. Then you learn, you teach yourself. You learn from nature, you learn from the bees, you learn from indigenous people. You have to be open to have the teachers. And then there are limitless teachers to teach you. The second part that has been forgotten, which again will be needed by everyone in the world, North and South, East and West, that we are community. We are not individuals. Mechanistic thought made us think everything is separate and unrelated. At the environmental, ecological level, it said the world is just raw material, just the lithium to be mined here and cobalt to be mined there and limestone to be mined here and iron to be mined there. But that limestone is linked to the water. I've done a study for the Ministry of Environment in India in 1982. And our study showed that the main role of limestone was not the raw material, but the water it held. And our mm. Supreme Court shut down the mining. Mm. They said if water is its first produce and everyone has a right to life and water is central to life, then a few miners' profits cannot override the needs of everyone else to water. Yeah? So even rocks are not just rocks, they are part of living ecosystems. But because we are part of living ecosystems, we are part of the earth family. And we are part of community. We have been made to forget we are community. Continue. We have been made to forget we can take up the earth as the commons. When I started seed saving in Navdanya, I created the commons. And we recovered the seed banks, community seed banks. We've created 150 community seed banks. Mm -hmm. So the fact that seed was getting privatized doesn't mean that trend will be there forever. We can create a new trend. So when you say in a city, what do you do? Well, everything, all of us have to eat. Give me one person who can live on a past forever in their lives. If you are, you could be a very brilliant yogi. I know yogis have done that too. <laughs> but I think ordinary human beings need to eat once, twice, three times a day. Mm -hmm. You begin with the food you eat. Mm -hmm. Where did it come from? How was it grown? Can I be participant in creating a non, more nonviolent, more just food system? Mm -hmm. And depending on what you have, you're in a city, you might have money. You can help the peasants. If you are running a magazine, you can be the communicator. If you're a restaurant, uh, you can be the source 
of ensuring the forgotten foods are back on people's tables. There are hundreds of ways. The beauty about the food system is it begins with diversity on the earth. It is diverse everywhere in the world and it feeds the diversity in our gut. So it doesn't matter where in this diversity you want to fit. There's lots to do. Okay. Okay, so you are driving me to, to another issue that, that I want to, 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 to ask you because, of course, our industrial uh, uh, culture uh, create, you said really clearly, like uh, it creates commodities instead of life, instead of food, no? And so and now you're talking about community. And so, so do you think that local, Com lo local production and local communities or, or, or communities of food are the solution against this uh, offensive of, of, of agro-industrial uh, 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 in a way to say, <laughs> or conquer? Yeah. So let, let's just come to basic facts. My last response was we all eat, right? Mm. So you can begin by making changes in the way you eat. Mm -hmm. Second supplementary thesis to that is everyone eats. So if everyone eats, why is it we build systems where the farmers go hungry to feed supply chains and the city people go sick? No, no. rural families must also eat. So what we have evolved in Nabani, and I have a book, it's in, available in English and has been published in five countries now, mm -hmm. and in Latin, Italian and in French. And it's my 37 years of research on ecology and agroecology. Okay. It's biodiversity, agroecology, regenerative organic agriculture. And it's got all the mountains of data out of these 37 years of research. And first principle, soil must eat. If the soil is starved, you get desertification. So you must do food for the soil. So you must have local systems. Uh -huh, Your uh -huh. long distance fertilizer is, has created climate change, dead zones in the ocean. Look at the dead zone in, in the Gulf of Mexico with all yeah. the fertilizer runoff from, uh, from the Mississippi yeah. that's going and dumping. And then you have, in addition to that, desertification. Fertilizer kills the soil organisms. Soil organisms are what make soil like living. Second, families that grow food must eat. Mm. So we have a very simple way in which we work in the Nabani movement. We say to people, grow food for yourself and let the market get the leftover. Mm. Why should you starve? Why should your children starve? to grow GMO soy and GMO corn for the marketplace, for torturing animals in factory farms or driving automobiles that don't need to be driven anymore. Yeah? For sure, yeah. So, so you, what you have to have is, just like I talked about the diversity of the mind, we need diversity of economies. Of course. And the diversity of economies must be beginning with the economy of the soil, the economy of the farm family, economy of the local village, economy of the region, economy of the nation. And you cannot have so many economies without biodiversity. Okay. That's why you must grow biodiversity. You can run a global commodity system with four GMO crops, corn, canola, soya, cotton, mm. that pushes a billion people to hunger, that pushes three billion people to sickness because it's not worthy of being eaten, shouldn't be eaten as food and is destroying the climate, 50% of the greenhouse gases come from this system. Mm. Mm. Instead, the minute you start saying, beginning with the local, outwards into regional, national, every country should have food sovereignty and food security. Mm. Let the global systems get the leftover. Right now we have a model where every farmer across the world is being locked into long distance supply chains of four commodities. And those four commodities are generating super profits for the seed companies who have patents and monopoly like Monsanto, for the grain trading giants like the Cargill's and the Conagra's, for the food processing giants like the Coke and Pepsi's mm -hmm. who need your GM corn to make high fructose corn syrup, mm -hmm. and 
the big giant distributors, both the old merchants of grain, but the new merchants like the Amazons and the Walmarts. And more importantly, most people don't realize that the people who are driving this food system are the financial giants, the Black Rocks and the Vanguards. I have a, a book uh, two years ago called Oneness Versus One Percent. It's mm -hmm. been published in Spanish mm -hmm. and it's been it's available in, in all the Spanish reading countries. Oneness Versus One Percent gives you who are the drivers of this system, because for them it makes money. But we have to look towards well-being well-being of all life on earth so it has to be biodiverse local mm. and chemical and gmo free because chemicals and gmos bring you disease so you know those are three criteria diversity localized and local does not mean insular local mm. our farmers by focusing first on what the earth needs and what their family needs they are earning 10 times more than the farmers growing commodities. They're earning more money. Yeah. Because yeah. they're growing quality now. And they're sovereign. Yeah. They are, in the supply chain, 5% is left for the farmer. Mm -hmm. In the sovereign system, 50, 60% is with the farmer. And immediately their income shoot up. So localization, a very important part of the transformation. Okay. Here in Mexico, we said when we are uh, agree with something we said a hope <laughs> so okay that, now now that you came to to to, to this uh black rock and and and, and yeah it's financial uh, uh issues behind all, all all these problems now in the last year the the, the fertilizers prices grown like 130 percent something something like like, mm -hmm. like that yeah. like that no so I have two, 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 two questions with this, with this fact, no? One is, do you think that this could drive us to a first uh, food crisis in the so-called uh, uh, developed world? Uh, do you, and do you think that this could drive economy or society or to, to, uh, to the needed change to 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 a to, to the to a system what you described what do you think about this because now it's like they are the, the bomb is blowing in, in in their faces with this with with, with these prices of fertilizer uh, uh, growing up no so. yeah um well i hope i hope that the unviability of the external input chemical model Mm -hmm. which was totally supported only by subsidies, even in the beginning. If there hadn't been the Green Revolution subsidies for corn in Mexico and rice and wheat in India, there would not have been a, a, um, a Green Revolution. It was a totally unviable system. Mm -hmm. So that as the system starts to unravel, then its unviability becomes clear. But if no one comes to the farmers, and says, but here's another way. You were brainwashed to think without chemicals, you can't grow food. Here are the ways you grow the biodiversity, you recycle part of that biodiversity, you feed the soil, you do agroecology, you do regenerative agriculture. All of these systems are now in place as examples everywhere, but they must reach the peasant. Because otherwise, what we could see is the increasing prices of fertilizer could make the distress of the rural people more severe mm -hmm. and people will become even more des desperate and mm -hmm. will start leaving the land. And what you will get is a large land grab. Mm. So we have two options. If we don't come to the support for the transition, mm -hmm. it could lead to a land grab. So Mr. Gates owns <coughs> most of the, he's the biggest farmland owner now of America. And yeah. these same guys, these you know, they, they won't be able to grow this lab food without feedstock from yeah. large fertilized farms. And for that, they will take subsidies from our tax money. Yeah. You know, right. they have the right. clout to be able to move the tax money in their favor. So what we need to move quickly as a community so that the people who consume food 
and people who are suffering the high cost of chemical farming say we all have an interest to go organic now we mm -hmm. all together must go towards regenerative agriculture okay. and i would add for the vegans uh, towards a non-violence that's non-violent to the woman with one cow the non-violent to the soil organisms mm -hmm. non-violent to your gut microbiome let's bring the non-violence of all of these beings into account and then we'll have a real healthy system oh. Yeah. Um, okay. So this drives me to to uh, an issue that I, I I cannot like avoid to to touch with you, which is the the this war on, in Ukraine, you know, which finally uh, it's well, it's a, it. I I want to know. I don't want to to to, to bring my opinion. I I want to 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 hear from you. What do you think about this war? Because finally, on the bottom of the war. There is there is oil, there is fertilizers, there, 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 there is gas, you know, behind behind uh, as a as a driver so of the war of, of, of this war. And it is start to become or it looks like a virtual third world uh, war. You no, know? so 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 what 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 are your feelings about this? And and overall, do you do you think this is like an expression of, of the crisis of, civil, of this civilization? Well, I think there's nothing very natural about this war, really, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would not see it as an unfolding crisis. But, and I, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I don't like to comment on things that are far removed from my life, mm -hmm. um, but I am watching mm -hmm. how three things have happened just in the last few days. The same toxic companies that have destroyed agriculture everywhere are now saying, oh, there's a war in Ukraine. Therefore, we can't have restrictions on pesticides. Oh, mm -hmm. there's a war in Ukraine. Therefore, we must have more GMOs. There's a war in Ukraine. There was, we must turn to cut down every farm tree and every hedgerow. Mm -hmm. So they want to complete the process of industrial agriculture as war hiding behind the Ukraine war. But I see a second element of this. Everyone is worried about the refugees. No one is worried about bringing them home. Mm. Isn't there something strange about that? Let's not forget that Ukraine is one of the most fertile land masses of Europe. And exactly at the time where the, I call them the poison cartel for ease of talking, you know, they're, the, they're a cartel of com four companies and they make poison, you know? Mm, Otherwise yeah, I'd have to sure. say, uh, I'd have to say Bayer, Monsanto, Syngenta Chem China, Dow DuPont, who's now Corteva, <laughs> you know, it's too long and too tedious, just poison cartel. The no. poison cartel is already trying to make Europe go backwards mm. on the agricultural transition. They have a farm to fork policy. They want to kill it, yeah? yeah. Okay. Farm to fork policies, you should grow food in sustainable ways, biodiverse ways, and food should be healthy. Mm. But exactly at this time, two days ago, the future of the world that the, these tech giants and the World Economic Forum are imagining, mm. a total digitally controlled world mm. where we don't have work, we live on a minimum income, mm -hmm. we all have surveillance, and here is U uh, Ukraine in the middle of a war, in the middle of a war, announcing it's now going to have social credits, digital um, identities, mm -hmm. social credits, where you, your value will be decided mm. by your ideas, your thoughts, your opinions. And, and I just feel that kind of a future is not a desirable future for the unfolding of full humanity, you know? Sure. Uh, surveillance capitalism cannot be humanity's future. So I personally feel there are many wars going on, mm. including the bigger players are more active, including, of course, selling all the armaments, yeah? Mm. Um, they're doing a very good job. I mean, if you see the gun budget has just exploded like that, they're doing very well, just like during COVID and lockdown. Mm. 
the tech mm -hmm. giants did very well. The Amazons did very well, exactly like that in this war. Mm -hmm. Two, those who make money by harming others are doing very well. And uh, I think we have to look at all of those lesser visible wars, because those are the kinds that will be spread around the world to try and influence our future by having more unaccountable, undemocratic power in the hands of five or six players in the world. I've just done an edited book from all the movements of the world <coughs> called Philanthrocapitalism and the Erosion of Democracy. And there's very active, uh, you know, uh, work in shaping our, our future. So just like the Green Revolution said use chemicals, GMO said use poor crops, Mm. Our work is to grow diversity and peace. Yeah. So to grow diversity of parts, diversity of cultures, and most importantly, by allowing diversity to flourish, to allow peace, because wherever monoculture is imposed, it's a militaristic enterprise mm. and militaristic monocultures are wars of multiple kinds. And this time we need to create a deeper peace. And I think it's very important for every person on the planet today to look at this deeper peace from their perspective and relate to what's happening in Europe today. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm coming back to the to the questions of the audience. And we'll have to be wrapping up after a while. You're yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I'm I'm go, go, going fast to to uh, uh, questions of the audience. One one which is uh, we consider important is they they ask. What is the synergy of, fem of feminism and ecology? If you could explain us that, yes. please. So the synergy of feminism and ecology is life. Okay. <laughs> life is what was banished with the witch hunts, the enclosures of the commons and colonialism. Yeah? Life became illegal. Knowledge of life became illegal. That's the witch hunts. Living your life in freedom through the commons became illegal. That was the enclosures. Living your life as free societies in your cultures became illegal because the, you had to live for the colonizer. You had to give your land to the colonizer, your labor as slaves to the colonizer. So ecology and feminism, in a way, let life burst forth in freedom again. Nature's life has been denied by the Baconian Cartesian paradigm of science. But nature is alive and true science. You know, I'm just by chance here on my table, I reread, you know, mm -hmm. I did quantum theory. Yeah, I so know. people like Schrodinger and the Schrodinger function and the psi function and all is what I grew up in. But it, this is the little book of Schrodinger. Mm -hmm. What is life? What is life? What is life? And he is, he has a physicist saying, oh my God, life manages to escape the trap of entropy. Because I grow a seed, it grows into a plant and never again uh, do I create entropy. I in fact, take energy and put it in organized form to sustain life on earth. Hmm. That, that was what was denied. People like Schrodinger saw it, but the Bacons had to torture nature and subjugate her. Women too, through capitalist patriarchy. Mm -hmm. second sex, women don't work, women don't have knowledge, women are merely reproductive machines, women uh, can be violated, and all of the greed of the global economy is playing out on women's bodies through femicide. You know, look at what's happened through neoliberalism after mm -hmm. NAFTA with women of Mexico. Yeah. Look at what's happening wherever there are mines, wherever there's a land grab, what's happening to the women. So, you know, the, the death-making culture, the death-thinking culture of the Bacons and Descartes, the death-making cultures of greed, of weaponry, of militarism, mm -hmm. uh, we need another way. All human beings, women and men, mm -hmm. need another way. And that other way comes to us by looking at nature in her life, looking at women and how, in spite of everything, they have sustained life. They have created care economies. And now everyone should move from war economies to economies of love and care. Okay, thank you. And well, nowadays there is a 
with all this information, there is a tendency on young people to feel like depressed or, or fall into in something that is called eco anxiety. Uh, no, uh, how how can we deal with with all this uh, tragic and unreversible news? No, we, we, which do you think is the way to 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 be aware of what is going on and and uh, without losing the faith, without like going deep on on, on uh, falling deep on, on this uh, echo anxiety or or, or, or depression or yeah. what do you yeah i think the best therapy is living <laughs> just like life is the connector between women and ecology living is the best best therapy and how do you grow life you grow life by growing food start a little garden plot take a pot and just say this little pot in my balcony will get my attention and instead of being worried about eco anxiety you will shift to eco care which will also heal your anxiety and it isn't that you have to become indifferent to the affairs of the world but they won't eat you up mm. okay. okay so gardening farming healing are very important okay and it's not And at the scientific level, I've done about four books on this, you know, mm -hmm. that organic farming and healing the cycle of renewal of carbon, of nitrogen, are the way to address climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, while you're healing yourself, you're actually also contributing your bit to the big questions that are troubling you and causing you anxiety. Thank you. To, to, to close up, uh, well, what does move you to keep fighting in for such a long time? No, and, and what, what, what's your move? What, what, what is your motivation, your drives to, to, to waking up every day and, and for such a long time and, and create all this, all, all, all this work that you create for, for everybody that I, I, I take the, the chance to, to be. To, to say thank you for you for all your your work through the through the years but just to inspire our audience what do you how, how can you describe what moves dr shiva what <laughs> moves you to 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 keep fighting to to keep working well i love life and i don't want to trivialize either my life or treat other people's life trivially mm. and therefore i have a passion for solidarity and compassion and being available and third especially why why have i spent so much time on agriculture because the biggest amount of lies were being told about industrial farming hmm. you know we're feeding the world gmos produce more chemicals are safe and every time these lies would block the positive option for people then my passion for truth comes to bear And I said, no, that's a lie. You know, here's Mr. Gates, one of the richest people, wrote rubbish in this book, How to Avoid Climate Catastrophe. The problem of methane is not because we fed the cows bad GM or soya. The cow is the problem. Mm. Yeah, the cow no. is the problem. It has. So no. they're literally cooking up. They're cooking up fake science. Mm. And uh, so I love life. I love my life. I like the I love the life of Earth around me, people around me, and I have deep commitment to truth, and therefore zero tolerance for untruth. Okay, okay. Well, Dr. Ashiva, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was such pleasure and honor for Biogia to have you here. And well, I I will switch a little bit to Spanish just to close up. Eh, bueno, los invitamos a todos a que sigan el trabajo de la doctora Bandana Shiva, eh, en, verán los links a su fundación, a, su, a sus libros, eh, y pues eh, sean bienvenidos todos a, a esta invitación que nos hace a trabajar por la tierra, a trabajar por la vida. No, thank you very much, eh, doctora thank Shiva. Thank you, thank and you. Love to all of you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Chao.